All right. Let's see if we can share a screen. Okay. Chrome tab. Linking in for S modules. Share. Do we see a YouTube video up? Yes, no? Yep. Okay, yeah, I, good. I thought I lost everybody. In this video, we're going to be linking a Delta V FRS modules theme uh, controller graphics to a control module. So this will show you how it's easy it really is with the software. So to do that. We've already created our control module. It's called LIC-100. We actually I demonstrate building this in a, in a previous video. So if I click here, we're going to be doing this in Delta V Operate Configure. This is another piece of software um, available in Delta V Suite. Uh, Delta V Operate is used for the human-machine interaction with the control system. So uh, let's drill down here. We need to have a... Uh, a main template that we can work with. So right here, it's called main. If you drill down into pictures, templates, and then main. Double click on main, it's gonna bring up a templated screen for us to work with. Uh, we don't need all this here, so we're gonna delete this. And what we'll do... Was that a question from somebody? No? That's yeah, it's super echoey. Is someone's microphone on? Could be, could be my speaker, maybe. Okay. I was just going to type it in the question. Sorry, go ahead. Do right now is we'll save this as a different graphic. We're going to just call it LIC-100. Actually, the dashes won't work. LIC-100 demo. Okay. Save that. And we're going to find the... FRS modules theme dynamo set. So drill down FRS modules theme right there. So I'm going to double click on that. And this right here is the graphic that we want to work with. Um, sorry, dynamo is what it's called in, in Delta V. So I drag this in. It's going to ask. So once this is this is a pre-configured graphic. Uh, when we click on the graphic, once you'll see here, it's going to bring up a faceplate to make changes to the controller, like set point, um, switching it from auto to manual. That better? All that is going to be pre-set up. And this is really easy to do. All we have yeah, to do is to, go. to our control module called LIC-100. So to do that, we'll click on this dot, 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 or browse button here. Uh, we're going to click Browse Delta V Control Parameters. And... You can see there's area A where we built our control module and LIC-100. So if I click on that, click Apply Now, and then just click OK um, to this Expression Builder window. You click OK here to Dynamo Properties, and now it is linked. So to verify that this is all working, uh, we can right click. I can't right click here. You actually, I think you have to. I know the shortcut key is Control W right there. So switch to run mode. So you go workspace, switch to run mode, or you can click Control W. It's going to ask us to save it again because we made a change. So yes, we want to save. It already exists. Yes, we'll replace it. So now we're going to be in Delta V operate run mode. And so you can see there's our graphic. Um, the alarm or the, the red banner around it is gone because there's no alarms present. If I click on this graphic, you can see it will bring up a faceplate. The faceplate popped up over here. I'll just drag it. And in here now, we can switch, like I said, from manual to auto, change the set point. Uh, we have to put it in auto first. And we should be able to change the set point. Um, so yeah, so you can see there the controller output jump down. There's other stuff that we can do, like if we click on the detail button down here. It's going to bring up things so we can chat up, uh, change limits, uh, enable any alarms. Um, we can simulate values, or we can set up tuning parameters. 
And right here is a link to tune with Delta the Insight, where we can do an auto tune on this control loop. So very handy. It makes very quick and easy to build uh, your HMI application in Delta V uh, by having these pre-configured Dynamo sets. So let's say you have to read an incredibly long email from your boss that you have to finish before the big meeting starts in Well. I wanted to know what to do when I had a big email before my What's meeting. That? I wanted to know what to do when I had a big email to read before my next big meeting in 10 minutes. You cut it off. You have a, me you have a meeting? No, no, no. That's what the ad was saying. I was, oh. I was interested and you cut it off. Oh, sorry. So kind of a brief little video and, and without context, it may be a little bit diff uh, difficult to wrap your head around, but let me give you a little bit of context there for it. So, what Cliff was doing there is he went through the process in, in Delta V of, of dragging an, a, an analog input module into, into the workspace and then a PID module and an analog output module and connecting all the wires and the BK Cal out and all that kind of stuff. And then he named the loop LIC100 and that all got stored in, in our control system uh, in the Delta V uh, Explorer thing where, where we built our control system. And then from there, all that data, of course, went into uh, a database somewhere, uh, the historian database or the data acquisition uh, server for the control system, and it gets stored there so that it can it can be used, right? The, the controller talks to the, the data acquisition server, and then the data acquisition server is the warehouse where other programs like this uh, Delta V operate workstation uh, HMI suite We'll go in there and they'll look for the same data that's created by the by the controller and through different protocols it will go in there and say hey i want the information for uh this level transmitter this flow controller lic 100 whatever it is and then we associate that to uh, a graphic and then the graphic software will go in there and, and it'll grab the information that it that it requires and put it up on a screen for the operators to to play with those of you who did the labs using the, the Delta V workstation will, will be familiar with, uh, you know, click on LIC 100 and then the faceplate pops up and then you can change the, you know, auto manual set point controller output, all that kind of stuff. And it's really quite an automated system uh, nowadays uh, compared to what it used to be um, back in back in the day where you'd actually have to, you know, grab individual little components. Now they've kind of got it all set up into a pre-made template. So if you've got a flow loop, for example, you can grab a template for that. Uh, you've got a stop start station, you can grab a template for that. And it gives you something to, uh, to build off of. So we're gonna look now, I guess, in the ILM that uh, how, the, how that happens in the background, basically the, the stuff that we don't necessarily see. So let's see if I can get us to the PowerPoint now. Share. And should have the PowerPoint up there, yeah? Yeah, it's there. Okay, perfect. So this is the stuff that's going on when we're talking about the HMI or the human machine interface. Objectives here, describe components and their applications. Uh, programming and configuration software used for HMIs, and that varies greatly by manufacturer. Uh, methods of networking, HMIs, not really anything new there. Uh, the same kind of networking methods that we talked about with uh, controllers basically applies with HMIs as well. Uh, software versions and updates we covered also in the PLC DCS portion, and it doesn't changed uh, significantly there either. Uh, any software that we get usually gets upgrades and updates and version changes and things of that nature. Uh, so that's not really anything new that we haven't discussed before. So we'll spend a little time looking at that. And change management as it applies to HMI program changes, which again is very similar to what it would be uh, for a PLC program change, for example, whether it's a ladder diagram or a function block or whatever it is. So it's again integrated into the same suite. Uh, when you buy uh, something like Delta V, for example, you get all this stuff together uh, and lots of the 
lots of this item three, four, and five, for example, are very similar uh, within the suite. It's just a specific software package that you're dealing with, whether it's the control studio or the operate uh, operate workspace uh, window for HMI or uh, database, whatever it happens to be. It's all software. It's it's all very similar in that regard. So first off, it says here, let's describe HMI components and their applications. So your average HMI system looks uh, something like this in the big picture. We have the, the PLC uh, system over here, which of course collects data from field devices, brings it into the PLC for processing. Uh, it gets processed in there and the math gets uh, done the PID math and the algorithm gets done, the controller signal goes out and changes the final control element. Within that system, we have to have some way of monitoring what's going on. Uh, the only thing that changes really in this system here is that we now take that data and it gets also shared with the HMI interface and that HMI interface provides uh, visual indication um, colors, noises, uh, numbers, that type of thing that the operator can uh, visually see so that he can make modifications to the process as, as required, whether it's a set point change or a controller output change or responding to alarms and uh, unusual conditions. He puts his information into, the, into this GUI, which is a graphic user interface or the, uh, the control station, if you will. And that information goes into the PLC where it gets written into the uh, database that they share. You know, they share the same basic database and it makes it changes within there that get sent out to the system. So there's really not much new here. We introduced the, the graphic user interface, which is the, the screen and the software that's associated with making pictures basically. But it gets its information from the same place that the PLC stores its information and gets its information from as well. So the evolution of HMIs and the interaction between man and the process started uh, with gauges and hand valves, um, local control where you would have a facility with, uh, with indications in terms of you know, temperature, pressure, and flow by, by gauges that are out in the field. You didn't have necessarily a control room. Uh, you started the plant up and you walked around and you adjusted everything according to the visual gauges and things uh, that were available out in the field. And time went on, uh, things went to pneumatic and then we built control rooms with uh, pneumatic controllers and big boards and great big walls full of pneumatic instruments uh, that were brought in from the field with great big long runs of tubing. Uh, which was awesome back in the day for instrument guys. And then it evolved, of course, to where we are now, uh, all electronic and all kinds of different ways of getting information from the, from the field uh, into a control room, uh, wired and, and wirelessly. All these methods are designed for the same purpose, and that is for the operators to interact with the process. And along the way, control became more effective and automatic. We're at the point now where most modern HMIs can handle most situations electronically, almost robotically, um, except for when equipment failures and severe load disturbances uh, exceed the capabilities of the, of the control system, and then that would require operator uh, intervention. And for that, we use the HMIs to notify us of situations uh, like this where we uh, where we actually have to step in as human beings. Um, but generally, it's indicated to us through the HMI and the way that we set up our HMI. Modern HMIs uh, then consist of two main components, and they are the hardware components, the things that we can touch and, and see, <clears throat> and the software components that uh, make all that stuff possible. So we'll talk a little bit about this hardware and software. Uh, and again, you have a pretty good idea, I believe, at this point in time, what they are. Uh, you've done, uh, you've interacted with these things in the lab already on the on the service level. So hopefully we'll just give you a theoretical background of what's going on when you're sitting there hitting buttons. Okay, hardware components. 
fairly limited. There's not a whole bunch of new things here. We've talked about operator workstations before. Uh, they can be computers, they can be uh, laptops, uh, the Allen Bradley uh, touchscreen workstations here, panel views, et cetera. These are all uh, hardware uh, that are attached with an HMI. Uh, this is the most immediate stuff that we're talking about when we're talking about a GUI or the, the user interface. These are the, the screens that we actually change the numbers on and, and touch and modify. We of course get our information uh, from somewhere and it's hard to see right here. I know some of you are going to say, ah, oh, you're taking a picture of a UPS. Um, but there is, if you see down here, it says server number two. And again, uh, with an HMI, it's got to get information from somewhere and it's got to be the same information that the uh, controller is getting. And uh, that is stored, of course, in uh, a server. Um, a data acquisition server or a data acquisition system which contains the current measurements and historical data and alarm data and whether it's one server that does it all or you have separate servers for individual ones depends on your plant how big it is um, the thing with these servers is having uh, standalone servers like this they're very very scalable so for example if i needed uh, my plant grew and I needed more I.O., I can add another server if I wanted to break it apart to have a, a historian server and an alarm server and uh, uh, operation server, I could do that as well. Um, but they are very, very scalable. We can just add them in as required or take them away um, as required also. So that's really it. There's not a whole bunch of hardware that you that you see out there those are the two major pieces that are in there uh, of course in order to communicate we have to have uh, communications hardware in there as well and we've addressed this in other issue in uh, other ILMs uh, network interface cards of course if you recall enable the connection to the process network and you're going to need at least at least one of course based on your system and again we're, we're at this stage now evolutionary uh, technologically wise where we're usually at the Ethernet stage um, it can be something you know going back into some older technologies whether it's RS-232 communications or uh, 485 communications or Modbus communications or whatever different type it could be but the network has to be built somehow um, and we need these communication interfaces and that is the responsibility of course of the network interface card. Software uh, wrapped up in the bundle typically, especially uh, the Delta V that we have, for example, all of this stuff is wrapped up in what we call a software suite. And that suite takes care of all the stuff that we really need for a control system, including data acquisition and delivery to and from the control system, uh, processing the incoming and outgoing data, and then, of course, transferring that data to and from the graphical uh, user interface or the operator workstations. Okay, data acquisition server, we've already kind of talked about this already, and I, I think you guys hopefully understand the, the process here. We have the field devices connected to our controller. We then have generally an Ethernet connection between our controller and our server where the information is stored. Remember the data acquisition server is like a warehouse for information and all the users come here to get the information that they need. So whether it's the um, HMI system, which would be over here or the, pro, uh, the processing system or the control system, which is over here, we have a central hub where we store that information that's re retrieved uh, as it's required. All these networks, of course, multitudes of different types of networks, uh, including Ethernet IP, Modbus Serial, Modbus TCP, Foundation Field Bus, High Speed Ethernet, all different possibilities uh, depending on your specific control system. Uh, remote I.O., oil and gas, uh, things where you have SCADA systems, you're typically going to be using Modbus and Modbus TCP. Uh, plants that are built on uh, foundation field bus with the multi-drop and all that kind of stuff. And then probably the most common one today is probably Ethernet IP. The IO subsystem uh, 
connects the tag database information to things like the DA server. So this is how the screen gets us real-time data. Uh, and it uses a different type of protocol than we use to go from the data acquisition system into the control system. Uh, it's, going, it's going this way over here, and it requires a different type of protocol than we talked about over here. So this is where the next couple of slides lead us into these two standard data exchange protocols that are associated with HMIs. And they are DDE, which stands for dynamic, uh, brain fart here, dynamic data exchange. Uh, this is the older version. We'll hit on this very briefly. And then we'll talk about OPC, um, which is a current technology that is used by most uh, systems here and uh, the shortcut industry term for this used to be called other people's computers uh, because it was a way of getting information uh, for your system from somewhere else and in this case it would be your operator station is getting its information from another person's computer or in this case the data acquisition server so the two main protocols that are used when we're talking about hmis and, and graphical user interfaces and the exchange between uh, software uh, that is used to create the HMI and the data acquisition server is typically OPC, but we'll mention DTE a little bit here in just one slide. Okay, so DTE, uh, mostly obsolete now, but worth mentioning again, as it is most oftentimes kind of, it's, it's easier to know where you're going if you know where you came from. So DTE is kind of old school. Uh, it used to use what something called handles, uh, to define the path to the requested data. And all these things do the same thing. They, they set out a path to the requested data so that we can get that information that we need. Dynamic Data Exchange used to do this uh, by using an application name, which was the name of the program. So uh, a, a program could be something like iFix, which is a GE product that is used for building HMIs. Uh, then it could have a topic name, which would be the name of the data source, so our, our data acquisition server, for example, and then an item name such as LIC uh, 100.pv or uh, .sp or something like that. So it's uh, a collection, an address really that's saying, I'm here, I need this type of address or I need this type of information. Here's how I want you to go look for it. I want you to look in this, uh, in this software for this topic name and then this item name and that's the way it was before and it hasn't changed a whole bunch but the, the protocol itself uh, has changed so that was that's dynamic data exchange and then we've evolved now to this OPC um, which stands for object, object linking and embedding or open platform communications or other people's computers um, but is it is kind of the state of the uh, state of the technology as we stand currently today uh, that we use for exchanging data. The most common uh, format or variation of OPC is called OPC DA, which stands for data access. And it is just more advanced uh, than the dynamic data exchange. So it's evolved a little bit. Uh, OPC brings with it these advantages over DDE. Uh, they include value quality steps, and we saw this when we talked about the control signals in a uh, Delta V uh, function block thing where we talked about, you know, good signal, usable signal, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a provision that's been added uh, to the old method of getting data just to make sure that we know the data is good. Uh, OPC also uh, allows communication between network nodes, so more variability in, in where it can look for information rather than looking at, at one particular server. It has the availability to go to many different servers in many different areas of the plant if we're talking about a distributed control network where uh, there are multiple processors and multiple servers. Uh, and then it introduces something called client tag browsing capability and basically this is just saying it's there's no middleman between uh, the, the HMI and the, and the processor and that's probably a little bit more in depth than you really need to know. Um, long story short we used to have DDE and now we have OPC which is kind of the state of the union and, it, and again this 
brings along with it many of the things that we saw as we walked through uh, control system protocols. Uh, you know, we went from two wire to heart to um, device nap to foundation field bus, and they all kind of built on the shortcomings of the previous ones, and this is really not any different. Okay, the tag database subsystem here. So the, the, IO, the data acquisition server here resides in between our control system and uh, our HMI would be actually way over here. The IO subsystem uh, contains all the values that we're measuring, uh, allows us to do different functions, scaling, et cetera. Uh, all the data resides in the tag database subsystem. Scaling is done here. Uh, data can be uh, external, such as device process variables, or internal data, such as set points that you had set up in a, in a window on the HMI. All named information points are stored in here and accessed for other programs. Okay, so this is our tag database. And it is really, it's kind of integral uh, to this. Um, but remember, we, we build this, right? We add we added uh, elements to a tag database when we built our uh, ladder diagrams in the lab. We created, you know, switch one, switch two, uh, light one, motor one, et cetera. Those all go into the database. Okay, the alarm subsystem of a HMI here, and this is probably one of the most useful things about an HMI that is that has been brought along with the technology is is the ability for us to really have precise monitoring of our control and having notifications running in the background. This is really the automated uh, benefit of, of HMIs is being able to give us you know not just when we're in trouble but the progressive uh, steps that happen as we get ourselves into trouble. So we spend a lot of time, or at least a few slides here, talking about this alarm subsystem because it's uh, it's really uh, a key component of the HMI system. And the alarm uh, subsystem is responsible for three primary tasks. The first one is alarm detection, sensing when things are, are not when we're happy. Um, this, the second part here is alarm enunciation or indication, and this can be visual, audible, and tactile, and we've we've often seen these things here. We have visual indications, uh, pumps turning red or pumps turning green, uh, different stages of alarms where we can have uh, yellow, meaning it's bad but not horrible, or red where it's fairly bad, or we can have red with a horn, uh, or red with a horn and a flashing light, so we can get different levels um, of enunciation. And the third thing that the alarm subsystem does here is alarm logging. So alarm logging uh, simply means that we store the data on a server for reference, uh, whether it's in the alarm database or uh, in a historian database, really you'd have the same information in both of them. But this is useful uh, for doing analysis of situations. So there's things called uh, FIFO analysis. So first in, first out type analysis. You can go back and say, okay, we just tripped our plant. What happened? Uh, I have no idea. Well, let's go back into the alarm logging database or the database historian and see what tripped first. And you can go through that information and, get, and, and figure out exactly what happened. And that's good and bad because uh, it makes it a lot easier to put the blame on somebody uh, if you can see that things were not being paid the proper attention. So three things within the alarm subsystem that are pretty important. So alarm detection, uh, alarm enunciation or indication, and the alarm logging. Okay, the historical data subsystem. Uh, again, we just kind of mentioned it in the previous slide here, stores of historical data that is collected for use as a reference for analyzing past events or trends. So pretty useful uh, to use uh, when analyzing things if they go bad. Um, several methods of data collection in terms of frequency, and we talked about uh, frequency, sorry, we talked about this, the same, uh, same kind of idea applies here. In, in this data subsystem as it does in the uh, control system subsystem, we can set the frequency 
uh, for collecting data. We can make it a continuous task that happens every 500 milliseconds or 1,000 milliseconds or 10 seconds or 10 minutes, uh, whatever it is. But again, the consideration is uh, using the resources uh, and, and that resource, of course, being storage. So this is a key feature uh, of the historical database subsystem. And a lot of this, I'm assuming you're probably going, well, this, none of this really sounds too, too new. And it really isn't because it's, it's kind of all wrapped up, as I said earlier, kind of in that software studio. Okay, scripting engine subsystem hidden deep down in there. Uh, as the name implies here, allows for custom script programming such as calculations, security, or navigations on the user interface uh, that would not be suitable in the controller mode. Uh, pretty next level kind of stuff. I've never seen this uh, being used, but then of course I'm not going to tell you that I'm an expert on this, but it is uh, something that is mentioned. Security subsystem. Uh, we've seen this. Uh, in the lab, if you uh, got into one of the Delta V labs, you know, you'll know that you had to log on and put in a password, and that's part of the uh, the security subsystem of the HMI software package as well. Same exact thing that you would have in the software package for programming the uh, the logic, right? It's it's no different at all. Um, we we assign access privileges to people based on where what their position is in the company uh, what access they need to have uh, are you an administrator are you an operator are you a control technician are you a programmer um, we set those parameters so the subsystem uh, in the hmi almost identical to the subsystems in a plc uh, software package as well. So it provides that protection of process control inputs, protection of the HMI operating system itself, and provides that user layer authentication auditing uh, that allows us to go back in and look at who did what and when. Um, so anytime you touch a button, change a set point, control or output, switch from manual to auto, et cetera, et cetera, it stores that information, not only the change, but who made the change. Uh, based on who logged in to that particular machine. So not really different uh, than we saw in the PLC DCS sections. Okay, the uh, graphic user interface subsystem, and this is uh, kind of something that's a little, little newer and more relevant to the HMI component here when we typically think about HMIs we think about this graphical user interface or the pictures that we see and the, uh, the input and output potential that we have in different function blocks uh, within this graphical user interface. So the GUI, of course, provides that graphical representation of the process and the input. So we can get trends from it, uh, bar graphs, uh, tanks that change uh, their levels uh, in a dynamic format. It is the operation screen. So it has all that information that uh, is collected and displayed for us so that we can make decisions. Okay, security and navigation controls. Uh, again, not, not too much new and unique here. Uh, they'll vary, of course, by the different type of software package that we're dealing with, um, but it'll show you things such as, you know, who signed in, what level of access do they have, We'll have navigation here that allow us to move between uh, different windows and different sections of the software suite. Um, again, depending on uh, the manufacturer, this is uh, Delta V, um, but they'll be similar uh, as you saw in the control logics. Uh, same kind of idea. All of these are generally kind of Windows based. All right, so that was just basically hardware and software. Um, the next objective here describes programming and configuration software for HMIs. And again, we kind of touched on this already. So um, most software suites uh, have the same stuff kind of all built in. It's not often anymore that you buy these part and parcel. You know, you, you usually just go out and you buy 
one big package. Uh, it's vendor specific, it's been tested, uh, the, the interactivity between the different components uh, have been proven and everything works very good. Um, so most software suites have this already packaged for you and they usually contain these three elements here. So the three elements are the project manager element, which helps us manage HMI projects. Uh, it'll have the development interface or the workspace where we actually do the configuration uh, and the building uh, of the screens themselves. And then uh, as in Delta V, for example, you do all your work in this one window as we saw in the video, and then you do a control W and the workspace turns from a development window into a runtime window. So it's essentially the same, same window, except that you're, um, you're getting out of the configuration and into the run mode. It's just like switching between program and run in a, in a PLC or a DCS type program here. So three, three primary components, the project manager, the development interface, and then of course the runtime or operation mole uh, interface here. So not different than a plc program right you got the explorer window here and then you got the um the main program where you do all your logic and then you put it into run and it does all the execution and, and displays okay here we get into a little bit of the more of the details of hmi so a uh, little talking on display resolution uh, this is handled in the project manager this is where you set your main parameters your general guidelines uh, for what you're going to do so you're going to set up your screens uh, how much you know memory you have available what graphic card you have available uh, all that kind of all that kind of stuff uh, is done in the in the project manager before you get into the specifics of creating a, a screen itself okay so just like home uh, bigger is better when we're talking about resolution most HMIs use a 16 by 9 aspect ratio and at least 720p resolution, uh, probably more common now for 1080p or better. Um, but this is at the time of writing uh, where we were at technologically. Okay, a um, couple of things that happen uh, when we're talking about resolution and resolution here is not any different than resolution when we are talking digital to analog conversion. Uh, the higher resolution you have, the more details you get. Uh, 720p is 720 pixels per square inch. Uh, 1080p is 1080 pixels per square inch. So you get better pictures uh, with bigger numbers. Um, talks about uh, upscaling and downscaling in the ILM here. So if you got a uh, you're set up for 720 and then you want to change to 1080 or you're at 1080 and you want to go down to 720 there's issues uh, related to them so upscaling such as going from 720 to 1080 rarely creates issues according to the ilm however it does state in the ilm that downscaling can create issues uh, and it is generally more difficult to do don't know why you would want to do it in the first place. Why would you want to go from a beautiful picture here, uh, 1080p, very well defined, and kick it down to 720p? It's like going from uh, Call of Duty down to Minecraft. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to do it, but mentioned in the ILM, uh, downscaling can be an issue, upscaling not so bad. Okay, graphic user face architecture. Uh, you'll see some familiarity here uh, to other software that we've looked at previously. Um, but this is specifically talking about how do you design your operator workstations uh, with some consistency? And there's uh, a whole branch of process science dedicated just to designing operator interfaces. Uh, there's a lot of hum, human interaction, of course, uh, with these screens. So there's a lot of psychology involved uh, that we really don't think about. Um, all kinds of different people run plants, uh, from very, very smart people to very, very dumb people. And when we design these things, we want to make sure that they're very understandable, they're not confusing, and they're not overwhelming to anybody. So it's good to have... Uh, a format that is standardized plant wide. Uh, this is not necessarily every single plant, but it, it does kind of highlight the fact that 
you got to have certain places for certain things that people become accustomed to looking for information. So just like our PLC software that we dealt with here, uh, navigation panel on the left hand side, just like Windows Explorer or, or um, any of the explorers that we saw, again, very Windows based, a certain area of the screen is going to be reserved for as alarm displays. And then a certain and the majority of the screen is going to be used for the live information that's being provided. Uh, from from the process itself. So how these exactly lay out in your particular window may be a little bit different, um, but it is important to maintain consistency uh, plant wide. Not really you guys on how big or small any of this stuff needs to be. Um, just understand that it's it's important in the design. Okay, naming conventions. I touched on this in the labs. Uh, this is pretty standard in industry uh, using these delimiters. Uh, I don't know anybody that doesn't program this way. Um, I believe it's pretty much the industry standard to use these delimiters. Uh, a delimiter is just a divider between two different functional areas of a tag name. Uh, it's, it's a verbose way of saying this is just the syntax that we use when we're programming. Uh, most software packages don't let you use dashes. Um, and fancy dancy symbols. Um, this is very common and I encourage you when you're programming, you know, TIC underscore 101, FT underscore 101, SW underscore one. Uh, this should be industry standard if you get yourself into a situation uh, where you're doing programming uh, for your work. Okay, development interface. Uh, this is a picture of a typical type of development interface here, all kinds of stuff going on, very specific again to the, to the software manufacturer in terms of specific buttons and layouts, but they are all generally Windows style um, and have, you know, most of the basic kind of stuff, you know, menu bar, toolbars, uh, Windows Navigator, uh, tools, navigators, templates, and things like that can be over here. Um, and then, of course, the, the main editing pane. So typically what happens uh, in this development interface, and as we saw in the video, uh, Cliff went in there and went, oh, I need, a, I need a template. So he went and he grabbed one from uh, the tools area or whatever it is, and, and there will be things for uh, templates for pictures, there'll be templates for communication configuration, uh, et cetera. But this is um, the interface that we use uh, for building the windows. Just like we have uh, an interface for building the logic, we have a, an interface for building the graphic windows. Okay, so we do our building in here. We can drag and drop things here. We assign them to tag names as we saw in the little video in the beginning. And you, and you noticed with Delta V, it looked really, really simple. And it, and it was, it was simple. It was as simple as grabbing a picture in here and saying, where do I want this picture to get its information? And you hit a button and you drill through the menu and you go, I want it to go to FT100. And you double click it and now the picture is associated uh, through uh, OPC or, or DDE or some protocol goes to the data acquisition server, grabs that data and puts it into the picture. And it ends up looking uh, something like this, right? We can have discrete, uh, discrete data gathered, tells us whether a switch is on or off, uh, or we got high alarm, high, high alarms, et cetera, et cetera. It can give us uh, analog values such as increasing the blue in this tank, it can be empty, down here and it can build as we go along. So uh, all the stuff that we configure in the development interface gets turned into this operator or runtime interface. And this is really the object of the HMI as, as most of us uh, imagine it. So it's somebody's job to, uh, you know, go in here, go into here, grab all the pieces that are required, drag them all into here, assign them to data, and then make this picture. Um, if you get into this, you'll you'll obviously get sent to uh, training somewhere, and it's kind of fun. Um, you can you can do all kinds of wonderful things here uh, when, without getting into it. Uh, it's it's complicated, but it's fun. It's it's like programming. 
Okay, objective three here, networking HMIs. This is really a review of networking. It doesn't matter if it's an HMI or if it's an operator workstation or a controller. Uh, networking is, is networking. The only thing really that changes uh, is the medium, whether it's twisted pair or ethernet or RS-232, and then the protocols that are associated with that particular mediums. Okay, so two primary concerns uh, dealing with networking in HMIs. The first one is scalability, uh, which is its ability to grow or shrink with the plant. Uh, not many plants shrink, um, but lots of them grow. So being able to add things is important. Uh, and we learned that with Ethernet, for example, we can add thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of different addresses and by using combinations of uh, switches uh, we can branch out almost indefinitely so ethernet's a really good one in terms of scalability and that's kind of why we use it uh, another primary concern is the type of network uh, faster flow data speed security requirements size distance etc will dictate what type of network uh, we are going to be utilizing uh, in the ILM. We talk about four specific network types and we've mentioned, uh, I think we've mentioned all of these before. So peer to peer is just one guy at one end and one guy at the other end. So very simple, not scalable. Uh, Multi-peer defined as a more scalable version of peer to peer that uses many data acquisition servers. Client server, uh, again, these are Evolving here, client server is probably the most common, um, probably the most common one out there right now. Uh, uses one or two data acquisition servers, depending on the size of them uh, or the redundancy requirement. You'll probably uh, your current system at the place that you work, 98% chance is a client server with two DAs, uh, and simply because. Uh, a minimum of two for redundancy. Uh, if you need more than one data acquisition server for volume alone, you're probably going to have four rather than three, right? You double up for size and then you double up for redundancy. The last network type, uh, web and some uh, sites are like this, mostly remote uh, things, wellheads and things of that nature will use web networking, um, which allows us with the uh, uh, Wi-Fi signals to run a plant from your phone. So four different types of networking methods. None of these are particularly new or specific uh, to HMIs alone. Okay, so here's peer-to-peer, one-to-one. Here's multi-peer. This is also, uh, what, what is this? This is an Ethernet one, so they're not just not just peer-to-peer -peer anymore. They can go these guys can talk to each other, this guy can talk to this guy, this guy can talk to this guy, they can all talk to this guy. So this is kind of client server, whoever needs it, asks for it and the server dishes it up. And here's a random picture. Objective four, software versions and updates. Again, this is very similar to uh, PLC DCS software versions and updates, uh, just like uh, your iPhone or your uh, iPad or your smartphone, uh, software updates and versions. So they're, they're the same, happens the same, like so. So maintaining software versions is an important part of HMI maintenance, just like it was an important part of PLC maintenance. You recognized. Uh, when we are in the lab, you're going to set up a controller. You're going to add your hardware to the controller. You want to make sure that you are adding the correct versions, uh, including the updates, just like we did in the lab. You had a 1756 uh, IV16D, and it had software version 3.003, and you started the program, and it defaulted to... Uh, software version 3.001. Well, what's the difference? Well, it might not be a big difference. It might be a little difference, um, but it's a difference. And they typically, you want them to match. If you can make them match, 
uh, you'll run into fewer problems if you can make them match. Um, but you can get away with them not matching, as I'm sure some of you may have noticed in the lab. Okay, so when we talk about version updates, uh, they come in three flavors. Uh, major software version updates, minor software version updates, and patch versions. And they're typically, um, regardless of the software that you're talking about, whether it's your iPhone or an HMI or a PLC, but they're usually in some type of a decimal dotted notation like we have here, and they usually represent uh, the same thing. As a matter of fact, the ILMs uh, used to and should still, in my opinion, and I brought this up at the last meeting, go on this way. Uh, for example, we're using uh, in this ILM HMI version 22 really should be ILM version 2.2, uh, meaning that it's the major version 2 with a minor version of dot two. And that just means that we started out with version 10 and then we figured out there were some, you know, there are some significant things that kind of needed to be changed. So we did a minor version upgrade. It went to 10.1 and then it went to 10.2, then it went to 10.3, 10.4 or 10.5, blah, 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 blah. Some significance with a minor version change. Less significant getting into this side over here, this patch version. Uh, and you'll see this a lot of times if you're an iPhone user, you'll get a patch update. Uh, this will create a patch for uh, something really insignificant that probably very few people actually need to worry about, but it was addressed somehow. So major versions, minor versions, and, and patch versions. So this is a serious rewrite of the ILMs. This would be, if I was going to take an ILM and, and do a complete rewrite of it, I would change it from version 2 to version 3. Um, if I was going to rewrite the section on uh, software, maybe I would change it to, you know, 2.1. Uh, if I was going to change uh, I mean, the software portion or the protocol portion, I was going to take DDA. DDEs out of the ILM, for example, I would have 2.1.1. Well, I've probably talked way too much about this. Okay, so long story short, different version numbers and the, the significance of those numbers. Way too much talking. Okay, so yeah, I already said all this already. Uh, I'm not going to continue. Objective 5. Uh, change management, again, very similar to change man management when we talked about uh, PLC program changes. It applies similarly to HMI program changing. Okay, management of change or MOC uh, is there to create and maintain a configuration and change history for these systems. And these systems, as you'll see, are all the subsystems that are associated <clears throat> with HMIs from the data server, the IO subsystem, the data tag database subsystem, the alarm subsystem, the historical data subsystem, the scripting engine subsystem, the security subsystem, and finally the graphic user interface. Good question here. Um, could be, you know, which of the which of the following is not a subsystem of an HMI? And I could throw, you know, something odd in there. But at any rate here, management of change, uh, just as it was uh, in the PLC, um, you log in, you're going to start doing something, you, you back it up, you start doing your changes, and then you, you record that information in, in, uh, in some type of a log, uh, whether it's on paper or in, in the computer itself. Uh, if you don't do it, it still gets recorded. Just somebody's going to have to go around and uh, compare one version of uh, one version of the program to another version of the program in order to see what has been changed. So again, having the documentation in place uh, so that we can we can know where we came from uh, in relationship to where we are uh, in terms of what changes have happened within the system. So same. Same same thing as uh, PLC programming. OK, 
Okay, key features of management of change uh, include tracking configuration changes, displaying the differences between versions, so comparing them, uh, rolling back an item or the entire database to a prior version. Remember, you must make sure you save so you have a prior version. Uh, creating change management reports and archiving of older versions. So again, nothing really new there in terms of change management uh, aside from the software that we're dealing with. That wraps up uh, HMIs. And it also wraps up control systems. So you guys are uh, you guys are into reading time and reviewing time now. And that's that's it. Welcome to the end. Stop sharing my screen. Stop recording. Anybody still awake out there? I'm still with you. <clears throat> Mostly awake. Mostly awake? Yeah. Good, good, good. Woo! Better second completed subject now? No. No. HMIs. First completed subject for me. By the end of this week, you guys will be done with me. So yeah. sad. Next next week doesn't look very fun. Well, I guess the next two weeks don't look very fun. No, this is where the rubber the rubber hits the road. Yeah, for sure. What do we got going on here? Tomorrow we have SCADA. That's a there's quite a bit of material in SCADA. Uh, Thursday SIS. Oh. SIS is absolutely horrible. Don't mean to encourage you too much, but uh, not fun. SCADA, SCADA is not, and there's a lot of information in there, but it's good information because lots of us deal with SCADA. And then uh, Friday, you get into maintenance planning. Next Monday, work, big workplace coaching, Alberta Industry Network. So those are kind of fluffy. And then bang, you're right into you're right into final exams. Yeah, Test Avenue. Test Avenue, yeah. Well, the good news is it's only it's one a day, so that's not bad. All right, folks. Any questions, concerns? Yeah, I got a couple questions, but I'll wait for everyone else to clear out, and then I'll ask you. OK. All right, we'll catch you guys later. Yeah. Hey, remember today's uh, 22nd day of the 20, today is the 22nd day of the second month of 2022. And at 1022, it might be minus 22 degrees. It's one of those crazy days. Like just you, Daniel. Okay, nothing um, too pressing or too confidential. I was just uh, wondering about these tests because I have a, a work week that's kind of landing kind of mid mid the uh, final week. Is right. there any possibility I could do some of my tests and maybe a couple of my finals a couple days early? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, what yeah. I'll do then is. Um, I'll probably try and work with my boss to reschedule a couple of days of work uh, so I have time to to, um, to study and such. And then I'll try and see if I can do my communications exam um, and my other other exams while I'm on my work, uh, while my day's off right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so, I'll, yeah. If, I'm going to talk to okay. Tim, and I, I think after Monday when he's done his last two lectures, I, I think I'm just, I think I'm just going to unlock all of my exams so you can kind of just write them whenever you, whenever you're ready. 
there's probably Did that include your finals then i think so yeah uh unless okay. of course the, unless of course the college decides that they're going to make some people come back to school but i, I don't expect anybody's going to want to come back uh to do any of these exams uh, if if anything yeah uh at any rate uh, if you're ready to write an exam just shoot me an email say hey let me un, you know unlock that exam and let me in and I'll be okay back. sounds good i'll chat with my boss then today and my wife and see what see what a good schedule then would be already the other question i had i guess i have two more questions if i was going to um need to reschedule the red seal to write at the local office here yeah is there anything i need to do with you regards to that or do i just need to schedule it and let you know you just i don't think i need to know anything as far as i know um once okay. once we submit a mark to ait uh i don't imagine they'll let you write it until they see that you've been signed off on by us um but Aside from that, yeah, no, I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything to worry about. Uh, I would recommend just calling your office and double checking with them. But I have never had to do anything for anybody. Okay, sounds good. I would prefer to come to Red Deer only because I've written a couple tests here in Hinton, and the time yeah. delay between writing the test and getting your marks back can be significantly high occasionally. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think so I'd rather gonna, drive. You're probably yeah. going to see that with COVID because lots of these people are working remotely and stuff, and that adds time typically. It's kind of a joke, but yeah, no, do what you want to do yeah. and um, just, just let me know. Okay, sounds good. Last question. Um, yeah. We've been talking about these softwares, HMI, PLC stuff. Um, is there any software such as we saw in class time that we can download to play around with the PLC stuff? Or is it all pretty proprietary? Oh no, there's all kinds of stuff out there. If you want to play around, you just you just have to uh, you just have to search around. I know it was many many years ago. I I bought I bought something. It was like ten dollars, and it came in the mail. It was actually a CD. If that dates if that dates me any, um, but it was a, <laughs> a it was a compact disc, and it had this. I can't remember what it was called. I still have it in my office at the college. But it was just a very simple, rudimentary PLC programming kind of thing. The downside is, is that it's they're not they're okay for the programming part, but they don't really get into the communications and the data exchanging and stuff like that. So if you're just interested in building like ladder diagrams, yeah, there's software out there that you can that you can fiddle around with. Uh, I would recommend just going on Google and seeing what the, the latest, greatest versions of it are. Um, okay, sounds good. Yeah. All right, that sounds good to me. That answers all my questions. And right, if CDs if CDs date you, I can tell you I was part of Columbia House. I did get 16 CDs for only one cent. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> I, that, that's good. I, I my first the first computer data I stored was stored on a, on a cassette tape. Nice. So that's very nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, and you have a good day. Have a good Tuesday. I will certainly do that. Thanks so much. All right. Okay. Bye.